Father, we thank you. We are grateful for this hour. Spirit of the Lord, we have worshipped you. But now we intend that you speak to our spirits. Open our ears, O oh Lord, and let your words come into our lives. Let there be a total transformation in our lives. Spirit of the living God, take over the sin right now and glorify the Father and the Son. In Jesus' name we pray. We acknowledge our pastor here, our reverend. God bless you for giving us the opportunity. You may take your seats. God is never at fault. God is never at fault. Man is always at fault. God is never at fault because he's perfect. And because all things that he has done is what? Perfect. Good and perfect. Genesis chapter 1 verse 31. And so he's never at fault. And why is man at fault? Yielding to the obedience of what he has finished. That's our problem. And the day you begin to surrender, the day you begin to yield, you see that the yoke becomes what? Easy. And the burden becomes light. That's why Jesus said, take them up. All you need is yieldedness. And when you yield, you begin to develop what is called the heart of gratitude. You become grateful in your heart at all times. You see God. You know why problem persists in life? is because we have not invited God into the scene. He's never at fault. When we give up and we give in to God, he takes over. Praise the name of the Lord. I will run through something in the next few minutes which is titled Provoking a Good and Bountiful Harvest. It's a follow-up of Thanksgiving. Provoking a Good and Bountiful Harvest. What is harvest? Harvest is simply to reap what has been planted. That's harvesting. So reapers are harvesters. And man was originally created. That is the origin of creation. He was created a reaper. Just to reap. Genesis 1.15 all that God created was very good and he put man just to do two things to maintain and to keep then eat whatever you want to eat so man was created a reaper sowing came as a result of the fall he was to continue in the work of creation what God has done just to develop on what God has done. So sowing came as a result of the fall. But then in Genesis 8.22 the law of sowing and harvest was now perpetually declared by God to take over the earth. And he said as long as the earth remains seed time and harvest shall not cease. As long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest shall never cease. What God did, he was able to create a time for seed. He tied seed into timing. Seed became seasonal. You subject it 
to the investment of time. But when he came to the harvest, he made it open-ended. He never subjected the harvest to time. Why did he do that? He wanted you to understand that seed has to do with you. You have to plant. But the harvest, the preparation of the harvest is determined by me. And that is why I am what? The Lord of the harvest. So he determines the season of the harvest. He pronounces the season of the harvest. But he expects you to what? Sow. So if you want and harvest, there is no short cord. The short cord and the longest cord is what? Sowing. Life itself is wrapped around sowing and reaping. Galatians 6, I think verse 7 or so, 17. It says, seven, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he what? Reap. So life is about seed. You sow and you get what you have what? Sown. That is the basics of what? Life. Now look at to, see you the, to show you the mystery of God. Everything in this world is full of labor. Everything is sowing. Even the rain that drops from the sky, the process of forming the rain generates or begins with seed sowing. How is the rain sown? The rain is a collection beginning from the water that is in trees, plants, sea, ocean, lakes, rivers, streams. These worms are in moisture form. They are water. They are liquid. But the heat of the sun, just like when you boil your water on the kettle, when it is fully boiled, you see the steam coming out. That's what happens. When the heat of the sun hits the water and is warmed level, the water begins to what? Boil. What is coming out of that water becomes gas. And that gas has no room in the sea again. It has no room in the ocean. It begins to find its way up to the sky. And as it's traveling into the sky, it meets cooler air or breeze. And then it, may, it, it, it meets with the breeze and then the breeze cools that gas down. And it's, as it cools the gas down, that same gas translates or changes again to what? Droplets of water. Those droplets of water now begins to gather together and then they form cloud. You see the process. And from the process of cloud, they stay in the sky. Then when they become too heavy, to still remain there, they drop back as water to the earth, which you receive as what? Rain. So you see that everything in this life has to do with what? Seeding. There is a process of seeding. So if you don't sow, don't expect to what? Reap. That's why the scripture tells, I think in Hosea chapter 8 verse 7, he that soweth the wind shall reap wild wind. You don't go into the harvest without a seed. You must sow. So that's the law. If you do not sow and you decided, decide to sow nothing, you sow the wind, God said, wild wind, that is what you reap. Praise the name of the Lord. So quickly, I want us to go back to this topic and look at it. Now, one of the possibilities of it is Psalm 65 verse 11. And what does it say? Psalm 65 11 talks about what God has done already concerning the harvest. What has God done concerning the harvest? He said he has crowned the year with the goodness and thy parts drop with what? Fatness. The word fatness is the word abundance. 
which means as the year begins to take place or it opens up itself God has already provided abundance or bountifulness and goodness for what they hear. So why is the year ugly when we enter? Why doesn't the year yield us the bountiful fruits that has been done by God? That's why I began by saying God is not at fault. So you can see that God has what? He has created the year and began the year with goodness and with what? Abundance. Which means God expects you to tap from the abundance. And how do you tap from the abundance? Harvesting. But Genesis 8, 2, 22 must be there. You must what? Sow in order to reap. Now, in the school of sowing, there, are, there is a bad seed and there is a good seed. There is a bad seed and there is what? A good seed. A good seed, Jesus said, produces what? Good fruits. A bad seed produces what? Bad fruits. So, you must know that for you to sow, you must not be careless about the kind and nature of seed you sow. But you must be what? Extra careful. You take caution to know the seed you are sowing. There are also good sowers and bad reapers. Good sowers, good planters and bad reapers. Have you seen a farmer who farms so well but during the harvest time, he sleeps. What will happen to his, to his crops? They will grow ripe and they will all get wasted in the field. Who is he? He's a good planter, but a bad harvester. Some Christians are good sowers, but what? Bad harvesters. They don't know when the opportunity to harvest appears. When the harvest draws near, they use their own mouth that they use in sowing the seed to cancel the harvest. But today, God is going to lift you if you have ever made those mistakes from the place of a good sower. You enter into good sowing into what? Good harvester. In the name of Jesus. So you'll be a good sower. You'll be a good harvester. Remember that the harvest is determined by God and you must lift up your eyes to look at the field to know whether it is ripe or it is not ripe. Now quickly I will run. What are the steps towards a good and bountiful harvest? Remember that God has already given us beautiful and bountiful harvest. So what are the steps you take to project and to produce a good and a beautiful harvest. I specifically said, choose your seed. That's number one. Choose your seed. And I take you back to what I just said. There is bad seed and there is what? Good seed. When you sow, there is a hundred percent guarantee of reaping. If you want to plant and then you go into your plantain farm or you go, you, you go into your vegetable farm and you take what you call tars, what the Bible calls tars and thorns, and you plant it among the vegetable. What will happen to it? It will choke the vegetables up. And at the end of the day, we'll be struggling to distinguish between the tars and the vegetable and you have struggle in your harvesting. What has happened? You have made the mistake of mixing both good and bad fruits to, uh, seed together. So the severance is now your problem. And you may not get a good harvest. So you must take your time what you choose to sow. And what is a seed? A seed is not just seed. A seed is everything. Anything that pertains to life is a seed. There is a seed of time. If you use your time carelessly, you don't sow it well, you will reap it in advance. 
And how are you going to repeat? You will discover that there will be no more time to redeem that time that you have lost. What is your harvest? Lost time. That's what you are harvesting. If you sow love in the hearts of men, you will what? Reap love. If you sow peace, you are a man of peace. Anywhere you go, you bring peace. You will reap what? Peace. If you are a troublemaker, that's a seed. Anywhere you go, trouble will what? Follow you. That's your harvest. So you must be careful the kind of seed you sow. If you are a quarrelsome person, you only take the grace of God to give, for you to give birth to children that are not quarrelsome. You are who you are. In fact, they begin to practice quarrelsomeness from when you are in the house as a mother. They learn it. So you must be careful what kind of seed am I sowing? Am I sowing kindness? Am I sowing virtue? Am I sowing love? Do you know that if you sow the seed of commitment to church and you attend church regularly, and you are a devoted member of the church. What is your reaping? Members of the church will bless you. That's your reaping. That's your harvest. There's no pastor that will look at the committed member of the church and will not, you know, favor that person. Because they are there. When the time of need comes, they will rise up to meet your need. So be careful. Don't choose a bad seed. Don't put pains in the heart of people. Put joy, put smile, give them comfort, make them to know that they matter. Show them the way out. Anyone who is a hard worker, diligently working hard, what is he going to reap? He's going to reap the fruit of his labor at the end of the day. And you must understand one thing at the time of toiling, nobody recognizes you. Nobody knows when the farmer is, you know toiling and he's wearing those his rags and going to the farm. But when the harvest comes, everybody wants to identify with the harvest. Why? Man likes enjoyment. He don't like suffering. That's the nature of man. So time that you didn't have food in the house and you are making sure things go right, nobody recognizes you. But just get one appointment. Everybody knows that you are somewhere the friends will increase. But where were the friends in the time of planting? They were also there, but they didn't show up. So, choose what? Choose what? Your seed, what you plant, matters a lot to you and to God. Number two, because I'm running very fast. Sow your seed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sow your seed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The scripture tells us that whatsoever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. What is this verse of scripture telling us? It's painting a picture because I'm talking to believers, I'm talking to Christians about seed sowing that in the era of seed sowing there is a distinction between the seed that comes to you through labor and the seed that comes to you through favor are you getting it the seed of the harvest that comes through labor is for all as genesis chapter 8 verse 22 as long as the earth remains seed time and harvest, everybody who taps into it through labor will get it. But there is another seed where the harvest does not come by labor, but it comes by what? Favor. How do you attract the favor to your seed so that the harvest can produce favor? Do all things in what? The name of Jesus. So he has given you the key. Do you know when the apostles were sent out to go and preach while Jesus was on earth? He said, any house you enter and you knock, you are going in what? My name. 
If you visit a brother and say, I come in the name of Jesus Christ, what does it mean? It's not you again. The presence of God has come into that situation. If you are discussing and you are going haywire in your discussion and you call, now we invite Jesus into this matter, you discover that the thing will work, change. His presence comes in. So the secret is that when you sow, you sow by praying and speaking to the seed in the name of Jesus. You don't toil through the night doing research and not praying. Doing research and not labeling it in the name of Jesus. You just research and research and research. And when you go to a promotion, they don't find your name. And you are a Christian. How? You have ignored the principle. They say, whatsoever you do, what do you do? Add my name to it. That name is a stamp. Once that name comes into it, the environment world changes. Why is the name so important? The name of Jesus Christ talks about the relationship between we and him. And what is this relationship? First is his name. You remember? God has given him a name that is above every name that every knee should what? Bow. So when you put in the name of Jesus Christ, knees must what? Bow. Including seeds that are barren. They must bow. And life must sprout out. That is how the name works. The second thing about it is talking about the person of Jesus. When you put in the name of Jesus, you are talking about the person of what? Jesus. If I say, James, come here. It is not going to be Pastor Seconde that is coming. It is James that is going to what? Come. So if I say, to the sea. Praise the Lord. So when I say, Jesus, take over this situation, I am inviting the person of Jesus, the name of Jesus, and the presence of what? Jesus into the scene. Three things have happened. And his person is his reality. If you want to know the reality of Jesus, it's his person. And what is the person of Jesus? It's the spirit of God. When Jesus visits you, he doesn't come as a human being again. What the, he comes as what? The spirit of Christ. And when the spirit comes in, what is happening there? The sin has been taken over. It means the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are what? Coming. Because when the, when the, body, when the, uh, the, the Godhead moves, the embodiment of the Trinity moves. So, Everything you do, do it in what? The name of Jesus. That is why in our regular meals, what do we do? Are we not the one who prepared the food? Didn't, are we not the one who went to the farm? Why do you call Jesus when you want to eat in prayer? It's a food you cook. You are there in the kitchen preparing it. You tasted it while you were cooking. The thing is sweet to you. So why did you call Jesus? He provided you are giving thanks, but you are inviting his name to the meal, and it makes what a distinction. It shows your subservient to him and your surrender to him. Christians make these mistakes. We take things for granted. We do so many things without inviting Jesus into the same. On Wednesday, I was telling you of how Bishop Oedepo will stand to talk, and all through the talk, he'll be telling you, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. What is he doing? It is no longer him that is speaking, but the Christ that have enveloped him is the one word talking. So he's making reference to him. You are studying for exam. Have you prayed and asked Jesus? To teach you that topic. Remember, he said he will give you knowledge that is above that of your lecturer. But you didn't invite him. You say you want to become an ethical. Well, that's your business. You may miss it. So when Jesus comes into the scene, what happens? Everything world changes. Hallelujah. Number, where are we? Three. So your seed by the direction and leading of God's word. So your seed 
by the direction and the leading of God's word. Luke chapter 5 verse 5. Listen, we are talking as Christians, we are not talking as those who do not know, know God. A Christian does not do things anyhow. You are not a zigzagger. You are an organized person according to the precepts of the word of God. And there is a word for every situation. There is no situation in your case, in your life, that solution is not available. No. Then God is no longer God. There is no case in this world that solution is what? Not available. But how do you call in the solution? That's the problem of man. That's why I say God is not at fault. How do you call in the solution? First is to discover the solution. A discovery. Everything that is tormenting you, there is an answer in the scripture. There is an answer. For nothing that is happening to you that you are the first. Neither will you be the second, neither will you be what? The last. It has happened to others. How did others survive it? That's the question you should ask. How did they go through that space enduring, waiting for patiently? The answer is what? In the scripture. Do you know that Peter and, and his brothers were fishing in the Sea of Galilee, casting net? The seed of Peter was net. He was not putting crops in the soil. So his net was his seed to catch fish. That was his hobby. So a fisherman also sowing seed, harvesting fishes. So Peter took his seed, which is called the net. Experienced fisherman. A fisherman that is experienced know when to cast the net what time not they follow the tide they follow the movement of the water they know the direction of the fish Peter with all his experience did all he could do and he what God nothing but Peter's case has been pre-written but not to his knowledge Peter's case has been written that when you toil like this, a man called Jesus will come. And when that man tells you what to do, do it. But Peter didn't know. So in the strength of his body, he has labored through the night. Then suddenly what God has pre-arranged before his birth happened, Jesus appeared on the scene. Remember, whatever is happening unto you, God knows it. Then the master said, Cast thy net into what? The deep. And then when you cast it, you will what? You will catch plenty what? Fishes. Ah. Do you know an experienced person, when it comes to your field, your skill, you are very experienced. And somebody who is not a fisherman, Jesus was not a fisherman. So human experience, Peter was more experienced. But he was the master. He was God. He knew all things. So he was a fisherman. I'm just trying to lay some bare example. Now, can you imagine somebody who has never made wood in carpentry workshop comes up to you and says, this tool you are making, I see you have struggled for so long. Can you do it like this and like this and like this? A man who is not an architect comes to you, you are designing a building, and he says, no, this building, you are not designing it well. You know that he is not what? An architect. And he says, now, do it like this, do it like this, do it like this. What will come out of you the first thing? Who are you? Is it not so? Who are you? Do you know this job? Which school did you go to? I graduated from London. Now you are coming to tell me this. That's the first thing that will come. Which school? Even your village, you are not going to primary school. You are coming to tell me how to drop land. But what did Peter do? He casted out his humanity. He took his humanity and what? Dropped it aside. And he took in the nature of a believing spirit. 
You know, the believing spirit is strong. Once the believing spirit comes in, everything takes a change. And then he said, Master, he said the truth. No, one thing with Peter is he's very vocal. He tells you the verbal truth. That's one thing about Peter and the difference between Peter and the rest. He will give you the verbal truth. He said, Master, we have what? Toil all night. Do you know what a fisherman will toil all night? Because night time is when he too. You catch fish. Now somebody is coming to tell you in the day. The night is when the fishes are moving. Now in the day, say go and cast into the deep. Fishes have escaped now. We have toiled all what night. I'm, I've taken nothing. Nothing means nothing. They didn't have one fish to go home, which means Peter's wife was waiting for the harvest. And if the harvest did not come and in pepper soup was not arriving, there may be what quarrel because the woman does not will not think of all the night you have done say where is the fish what will the children eat concern he said we have toiled all night nevertheless everybody say nevertheless 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 despite my experience in fishing Despite my background that my father taught me how to fish and I was born into the fishing family, despite who I am, when it comes to the knowledge of fishing, at thy word, at thy word, what is that word? Direction. What is that word? Leadership. Leading. So, Peter casted the net not based on the experience of fishing, but how? By the word of the Lord. When things confront you, like I said, there is a word. Have you searched out the word? Sometimes just keep quiet and just listen to your spirit, man. You know, the most active part of you is your spirit. But we think that the spirit is inactive. It's the body that is man. That's the most active. But it's very quiet. It doesn't like disturbance because it knows the truth. The spirit knows the truth. If you are not born again, the spirit knows. You can deceive with the body. If you are born again, the spirit knows. So when you listen to your spirit, the spirit of God in you, you will hear. You will hear. There are times that God has given me words in the night. Specific word on cases and situations. And I would jump Open that exact verse of script, chapter and verse of scripture, and what he told me is exactly what is there, which means that is the solution to what the problem. And then I will grab him and shout, I have found it. That's the end. Terminated. You have, the voice of your spirit is the real you. That's the one that will go to heaven, not your body. You should concentrate less on listening to your body and concentrate on what? Listening to your spirit. It has several messages for you, but you have not searched for it. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. So, Peter casted that thing down and at the end of the day, the Bible says he got several world fishes. And what did Peter do? That's what it comes to abundance. Peter after carrying the nets and they could not grab the fishes and then they called out come and help us and then he said depart from me I am what a sinner I'm running number what number four Nurture your seed with prayers and the continual development of your faith. Nurture your seed with what? Prayer. Philippians 4, 6. Whatsoever we do, the Bible says, by prayer, we should not be anxious for anything. In other words, when you have sown your seed, don't think that because the seed is beautiful, there is a guarantee of harvest. No, don't be over anxious. You have done all things, so it's okay. No. Go to God and present that seed back to God, praying for the harvest. 
So you are not anxious, but you are very concerned of what you are doing, knowing that the strength that you use in doing it did not come from you. That's why Paul said, when I say I am weak, that's when I am what? Strong. Because he knows where his strength is coming from. So you present that thing to God and say, I have planted. That prayer is watering the seed. I have planted. I hand over this job into your hands. I hand over this assignment into your hands. By my own, I can do nothing. You see, one of the simplest prayers God likes is not prayers of boastfulness. Is prayers of surrender. When you pray prayers that you are not boasting before him who knows everything about you, he comes in. Once you surrender, God, that is why I say he dwells in he that has what? A broken and a contrite spirit. Penitent spirit. The one that will humble himself and say, I am nothing. That's the one God is interested. Not the one that will brag, I know everything. So after the seed, what do you do? You pray and what? You give thanks. And if you read the next verse, what did it tell you? It tells you that the peace of God shall what? Keep your hearts and your mind. What is the peace? The peace is talking about the time of the harvest. The distance between the productive seed and the harvest time, you will experience peace, not disturb. So that gap, you will have peace. So you will have the patience from above to wait for the harvest time. Praise the name of the Lord. How? He is sustaining you from the period of the seed to the period of war, the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, what happens to you? Celebration. Praise the name of the Lord. Where are we now? We are in number? We are going to number five now. Keep to the covenants of God and do them. Keep to the covenants of God and do them. Psalm 89 verse 34 says, My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of what? My lips. Covenant practices gives you the ability to enjoy the harvest of favor and not labor. That's one of the covenant things that happens in covenant. In Daniel 11.32, the scripture tells us that those that do wickedly against the covenant, what is God going to do? Say he will corrupt them by flatteries. Now, that, when I look at that scripture, it became dangerous to me. When Satan is not the one corrupting you, and God is the one that has decided to leave you to corruption, is the most dangerous thing. Satan corrupts. But now God's word is leaving you to continue with what? Flatteries of corruption. Why? You have broken his covenant, which he said he will not alter. What is a covenant? It's an agreement between two persons with a token, a seal. The seal of salvation is the blood of Jesus Christ. The seal of your redemption is the blood of Jesus Christ as a token. You say, I'm under grace, no covenant. Covenants are covenants. All Old Testament covenants are permissive. But covenants that we are drawn up through the era of faith and promise, they last. They are there. Those ones are permissive. They have not been abolished, but they have been what? Fulfilled by the law. But the one that comes out of faith that God himself spoke by Abraham, which he saw by himself by no greater, he said by an oath, he said, surely in what? Blessing. I will what? Bless Abraham. But what does he expect Abraham to do in return? Retain right standing and be obedient to him. Because God has promised Abraham doesn't mean Abraham will live anyhow. So when Abraham maintains the covenant, then the second point of that verse 32 of Daniel chapter 11 comes in. What happens to him? He says, For they that be 
strong. They that do know their God and their word strong. They shall do what? Exploit. Exploit is abundant harvest. Bountiful harvest. That's exploits. Exploit is not for those who are mediocre. No, you can't make employed. Exploits are no those who are operating on guesswork. Let's try it now. No. Exploits begins with what? Strength and knowledge. You have the combination of strength and what? Knowledge. Then you can apply the knowledge and the knowledge will give you results that are what? Exploring and exploited. Praise the name of the Lord. I'm running with time. Several things to do. What number are we now? We are going to the number. All right. Believe God's word that comes through the mouth of your prophet. Believe God's word that comes through the mouth of who? Your prophet. When we say prophet, most times people think otherwise. That is one person who is going to come and tell me the history of my family. I saw two birds flying in your house. One of them is green. One of them is black. If you don't kill the black one, you are going to suffer. We are not talking about that kind of prophecy. The prophet is who? Your pastor. That is the man God has put to feed you with the word of God. As a shepherd. And listening to the word of God, not his words, the word of God that proceeds out of his mouth. You know, there is a difference between the spirit of man and the spirit of God. When the pastor is speaking of his spirit, you can see. When he's speaking from the spirit of God, you know. So when that velocity comes out and you know this is the word of the Lord, what do you do? You grab it. Praise the name of the Lord. What happened to, her, to the widow of Zarephath? She was not of the stock of Israel. The prophet declared a famine in Israel. There shall be no rain. Elijah. This same prophet went to a widow and told the widow, give me your last meal. The widow said, truly, what I have here is the last meal. If I give you, me and my son will die because we are preparing to eat and then what? Die. Then the prophet spoke. Praise the name of the Lord. Elijah was the pastor of that woman for the famine period. She identified it. If God cares for the widow who was not a Jew of the stock of Israel, and in a famine of three years, he will send a prophet to redeem her. How much more you who is called by his name? He said, give me the food. Then Elijah brought in, that's what I said. Remember, what is the number two? What is the number two? Who can remind me? What is number two? In the name of the Lord, Elijah sowed the seed of abundance in the life of that woman, the widow. In his name, what did he say? As long as the Lord thy God liveth, he brought God into the scene. So the seed that Elijah sowed for a bountiful harvest in the life of the widow of Zarephath was not a product of him, it was a product of the invitation of the person of the Godhead into the scene. And then when the Godhead entered into the scene, did the scene change? Yes. For the period of the famine, they were eating. They were eating. I have had experiences where there has been a crash in the economy. And there was nowhere to go. But the God who told me, keep this money aside. And I've forgotten that those, that money I was keeping aside is there. I'm not a man who is even too good in savings. Keep this money aside. And I kept it. 
when that time when the economy became battered came the Lord matured the money from the beginning when the hardship came they called me and said the money you invested with us is ripe at that time there was what nothing can you imagine for that period how will it be aged parents relatives people I'm sponsoring in school and then I will go and beg and then he said come and take when that investment profit came to 5,000 naira the economy changed which means God was watching 5,000 can't last me for one week so now he needs to what? Kick over. Then things began to what? Come back again. So what happened through the period of the economic meltdown that was there? There was a sustenance from above. And I was giving to people they didn't know the source. I was blessing life. I was paying school fees. I was doing things. I was feeding people from that little thing. Praise the Lord. Number what? We are in number seven. So bountifully and not sparingly. Second Corinthians 9 6. Luke 6 38. Second Corinthians 9 6. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly, that is little, stingy. Sparingly is not talking about the velocity of what you have. He knows your income, but when you are stingy, that's the sparingly is talking about. Sparingly shall reap also what? Sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also what? Bountifully. The word of God is not broken. Now, I gave you an instance last time on Wednesday. If I have 500,000 naira and let me say 1 million naira and I decide to invest 50 kobo what is going to be my return? Interest according to my word 50 kobo but if I take the risk and invest the entire one million, what is going to happen to me? My return will be the profit word on the one million. So if I sow 50 kobo, which is apparently while I have one, one million naira, and I'm keeping it aside, I will reap what? Sparingly. I will reap something that is not proportionate to what I need. But if I sow bountifully, what is my expectation? I will also reap what? Bountifully. That's the principle of what, the God of God. This comes to the issue of giving. Issue of what? Giving. Jesus said in that place, I think Luke 6, 38. Give, which is a commandment. It shall be given unto you. Good measure. What, what happened? Press down. And running over. Shaking together and running over, shall men give unto what? Your bosom. Three things happen. You give. That's the first aspect. Press down. That's what happens. The harvest. Shaking together, security. Which means what God returns to you when you give cannot be tampered. Running over, that's abundance. Shall who? Did he say God? God has already done his own. What is his own? Commandment. Give. That's his own. So when you obey, what happened? Men shall war give. That is where the favor of where that is where the, 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 the harvest of favor comes in. Not the harvest of labor. So he causes men to war give unto you. I'm rounding up now. Because of the consciousness of time. 
Now, also you must learn how to sow multiple seed in multiple fields. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 1 and 6. Cast your bread upon the waters. It didn't say water, waters. After many days, you shall find them. So, whatever opportunity you have to give, you give. Whatever opportunity you have to sow, you sow. You don't know which one is going to yield a better harvest. Number eight, be thankful to God for all things. What did I say? Be thankful to God for all things. First Thessalonians 5.18 In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Thanksgiving is what we'll be doing next week. What is Thanksgiving? Thanksgiving is a free will offering. Either through the confession of your lips, by words, by praise, or by gifts. In thanksgiving, it is expected that your heart should be filled with gratitude when you are giving. Because when your heart is not with gratitude, God will reject the thanksgiving. When you thank God, thank him. And that takes me to one critical issue before I go back to thanksgiving as a roundup. In the modern day church, there has been quarrels on tight and tightening. In the New Testament, Titan was only mentioned three times. I think in Matthew, in Luke, and in, in Hebrews 7. But do you know that this same Titan did not start with the Levitical order? Where did it start? It started with the order of Abraham. And what, what, what provoked Abraham to pay tithe when there was no law? He came from the, harvest, the, the slaughter of the kings. And then he defeated those kings and rescued his nephew, Lot. And then when he came, Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God, who had no father or mother, no beginning of days or ending of days, offered first to Abraham bread and wine symbolic of the communion Abraham was the first to take it in a shadow he offered to him bread and wine at the first instance and then the priest never told Abraham now give me your tithes he didn't say so what did he do he said Abraham did what? He paid tithes of what? All. Take your mind back to the scripture. What was Abraham doing? Abraham was simply giving thanks to God through the tithes. That means tithe is your thanksgiving to God for what you have already received. Are you getting it? When you begin to have another spirit to all these things, you, your life will be operating in faith. Abraham was thanking God for what he has received. So for what he has received, he was giving thanks to God. Offering is what you give to God in expectation of what you are going to reap. That's offering. Tight, you have already received. You are thanking God. That's why the Lord said, honor the Lord with what? Your substance includes your tight. Your substance. So anything you are giving honor to somebody, is it not thanksgiving? You are thanking him. So thanks, tithing is part of your thanksgiving. But the difference is that it is defined. It belongs to God. It's not your own. Tent is mine. The word tithe means tent. Tent is mine. Give it to me. I told you severally, nobody can tell me now to stop paying tithe. Even if the church says stop paying tithe, I will continue to pay. And let me also correct one thing. In the real language of the scripture, in the Abrahamic order, you do not pay tithe, you give tithe. 
Are you getting? In the Levitical order, you pay tithes. Because it was like a debt. And if you miss it, you redeem it, so you pay it. But the language the scripture used for Abraham, he, what? he gave. So tithe is almost, almost 100% voluntary. You gave. So when somebody announces, pay your tithe, there's no language like pay tithe. Give your word, tithes. I correct that. Praise the Lord. Finally, I round up here. I know that everybody's looking at the time. There is something common in Africa. And that's thanksgiving. Particularly in the Christian churches. Everybody knows how to give thanks. When some God has done one important thing to you, you carry Nama, you do this, you celebrate, you give thanks. I want to give you a scenario for you to think. You want to give thanks to God. You spend 2.5 million in food cooking for the people. For your clothes, 1 million naira to dress on that day. In the envelope which is for the Lord, 50,000 naira. Where is your thanks offering going? I corrected myself. I made these mistakes too. If I want to give thanks to God and I know that I want to celebrate, I will celebrate differently. When it comes to thanksgiving, the percentage of what, because the thanksgiving essence is for God, it's not for man. You are not thanking man. There's a time to throw party. That one you are celebrating with your friends. But now you decided by yourself that you are coming to church to what? Thank God. So why is the percentage you give to God smaller than the percentage you give to yourself and to your friends? Your thanksgiving is equal to the thanksgiving of Cain. Don't deceive yourself. That is the scripture. And what do you do? Repent. What do you do? What do you do? The Lord bless you in Jesus' name.